Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 New York International Children's Film Festival. I'm so excited that you can join us. Um, this year, for the first time ever, we're able to reach audiences across the country. So welcome wherever you are. Good afternoon or good morning. Uh, I'm Maria Cristina Villaseñor. I'm the programming director of the New York International Children's Film Festival. And I'm so excited to have with us today Daniel Snadden and Max Lang, the directors of Hello, <laughs> The Snail in the Whale, and Zog. We have a really special program this year that celebrates Magic Light Pictures. We've had an amazing relationship with Magic Light, showing so many wonderful films. Um, Daniel and Max have worked on the original Zog. This year, we're celebrating the new Zog, Zog and the Flying Doctors, and that screening with The Snail in the Whale. Um, and we are doubly excited that this year the snail and the whale is on the shortlist for the Oscars. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Fantastic. So um, just before we get started, um, I just want to take a brief moment to thank all of our wonderful supporters and everybody who helped to make um, the film festival possible. So thank you to our members. Thank you to our board. Thank you to our staff, to our incredible interns, to our programming committee, to everybody that makes this nonprofit uh, possible to create this great mission of creating more intelligent, more diverse films for kids and bringing them to all of you. So um, please, I hope you can check out our programs, consider being a member um, and help us to do the great work that we do in terms of um, celebrating these brilliant films and filmmakers. Um, so without further ado, let's get back to Dan and Max today and to The Snail and the Whale. Um, as I said, we're gonna be focusing on this film today um, and really having an exciting look at um, everything that it took um, for you all to make this incredible film. Um, but I thought that first we'd just start off by dipping everybody right into the incredible visuals and the wonderful story of The Snail and the Whale. So let's take a look at that trailer, please. This is a rock, black as soot. And this is a snail with an itchy foot. How I long to sail. This is the whale who came one night. Come, sail with me. This is the sea. So wild and free. She gazed and gazed, amazed by it all. But then came the day oh. the whale lost his way. I must not fail, said the tiny snail. Save the whale! I get chills looking at that every time I see it. <laughs> I'm sure our audience does. Um, I just want to point out to you, Jan and Max, that we were inundated with requests to um, screen the snail and the whale again after we did last year. Literally, everyone was calling us um, asking to see it again. And we're so lucky and thankful that we were able to bring it back. Um, but I wanted to start out by um, emphasizing this lovely story of partnership and friendship between the snail and the whale and talk about both of you and um, you know just ask how your own you're both amazing animators in your own right but how did your collaboration uh, get started with Magic Light and what was that process like of working together to bring these beautiful films to life? Um, so I started working with Magic Light back in 2008 when we were first working on the Gruffalo. I was still in film school and my mentor and teacher Jacob Shu um, was directing the, uh, to the Gruffalo or working on it and at some point he needed a co-director and I, I had started working on the film as a storyboard artist and I really fell in love with the world and the characters and that's how we got involved and it was quite funny early on we were wondering if people were even interested in seeing like a book that takes about seven minutes to read adapted into a 26 uh, minute film without adding much dialogue. But um, 
now we've come to realize that actually people really like to have uh, moments to breathe and just leave some room for the music and um, yeah, have a more relaxed pace. So we've, uh, we've tried to embrace that since. And I feel like with the snare and the well, we really hit the, uh, a, a really nice peak with that. Um, it's, I feel like it's our most poetic film. Yeah, I would say it's definitely poetic. Um, and you're both working um, in different places. So um, Dan, I'd love to hear from you and just uh, tell a little bit about how you came to this project. Sure, so um, I'm based uh, in Cape Town in South Africa is where I am right now. And um, I started working with Magic Light on the special Stickman, which um, I was invited to, to, to come down to Triggerfish Animation. I was living in Johannesburg at the time and to, to meet uh, Michael and Martin, our producers at Magic Light. And, um, and, uh, and that was back in 2014. And since then I've worked on pretty much all the specials. Uh, we did Revolting Rhymes in partnership with them and, and their German studio. And, uh, and then we also handled the Highway Rat uh, here in Cape Town um, and Zog, which Max and I uh, directed together. And, uh, and then Snail on the Whale really um, came about while we were finishing up Zog. So uh, that uh, it's it's um, it's uh, it's it sort of just naturally flowed from one one project into the next. That's interesting, though, uh, because there there are also like very different um, tones in a way. You know, there's um, revolting rhymes um, for some of our audience that uh, had a chance to watch that. Uh, it's based on rural doll stories and really has like a great wicked humor and then uh, Zog is a little bit more narratively based and this one um, as you said is very poetic so it's interesting to just think about um, how do you flow from from creating these great stories that land so well with even very young children um, but change those tones. Well I mean I think that's, that's one of the beautiful things about the work of Julia Donaldson and Axel Scheffler is that they yeah they write these books the same author and illustrator they usually rhymed um, but they're all very different in tone. So I think we are responding to the picture book, to the source really, and um, trying to figure out what is the right tone for this. And I feel like, yeah, Zock is on the other spectrum. It's much more character-based humor and much sillier. Um, and um, yeah, Snell and the Whale is all the way on the other side, I think. Um, and, but that, that is so much fun, like for me working on these films. Yeah, you, you might think they're all the same, but actually, every book and every film is very different and it requires a very different approach. Yeah. Absolutely, it's, um, it's kind of a nice metaphor too for you know, kids and um, just the different play worlds that they create, you know, this, this wonderful parallel of like, not all the scenarios are the same. Um, and maybe um, the best thing to do right now is to dip into our next clip because um, this is a wonderful, um, we have a series of excerpts from the making of The Snail and the Whale um, that will um, just take you a little bit behind the scenes. Um, and then Dan and Max will um, expand on what we're seeing. But um, this next clip just um, talks about what you were just saying, Max, in terms of that uh, transformation to book to screen and, and thinking about how you all did it. So uh, let's play the next clip, please. I don't think we changed too much really because the story in the book is very well rounded and the character arcs are very clear so we mostly tried to add a relationship between the snail and the whale and try to add little interactions with them which is quite tricky because there's such <laughs> different scales and luckily the first animatic kind of proved that we could do it and you could deal with it huge scale difference and, and still make them feel connected. And far off lands. With fiery mountains and What we discovered was that when the whale looks, just looks towards snail, the whale looks towards him, you already establish a relationship. Most of the time the snail is on the tail of the whale. <laughs> it's very far away, but because of the editing, you feel that there's still a, a strong relationship between them. The world of Snail and the Will, like our world is actually, it's almost like a character in the film because the story is really about the beauty of the world. And so we knew that it would have to look incredibly great. 
you had to go on this journey with Snail and experience the beauty of the world. The size, this huge scale of the world. The approach really was, let's, let's look at what's really beautiful about these illustrations that the parents and children will remember. And then it was just really about filling in the detail. Um, there's, there's a simplicity and a beauty to the simplicity of Axel's drawings. And we really tried to kind of capture that in the character of, of, the, of, the, of the environments and then just sort of add a, a subtle layer of, of extra detail to make the world really expansive in, in CGI. There's so much to dig into with this clip. <laughs> Um, maybe for starting out, you know, by that, that um, crafting the world as a character, as you said, I know that um, when we screened this last year in the theaters, um, I think that our, um, our parents and our kids were both so, um, so excited to just be in this immersive environment, you know, um, you just really feel like the almost sense of awe of, um, of that of the sea of what they're traversing. And so I'd love to just um, hear a little bit from you both about crafting that world. And also you see that amazing transformation from you know a, a 2D, a book illustration to this wild 3D world. So also maybe take us a little bit through that journey of, of what's involved. Sure. Well, the first thing to say is I'm just so happy that um, that your audience got to see Snail on the Whale in theaters, because that's really the way to experience it. Um, the team, uh, we had a, a wonderful team who had been working on um, uh, all the Nagelite specials since Stickman and, and had a lot of, uh, of stuff that they wanted to try out and a real, um, uh, just a real passion for, for bringing these illustrations to life and, and then sort of really um, pushing, pushing the, the, the boundaries of what we could do in CGI for, for TV. And, um, and I think that you know, for for us, the really um, exciting thing was just the variety. That there's an enormous amount of variety uh, in the different environments. You have everything from um, you know tropical islands, as you saw, to to massive uh, glaciers, and so each one comes with its own uh, particular um, set of of problems you need to solve. Uh, and so there's an enormous amount of um, variety for the artist to kind of get stuck into. But I think that, as you saw in the clip, the really um, interesting challenge was trying to create that sense of, of scale because, you know, our, you know we all, all love stop motion. Uh, that's, we're really passionate about, um, uh, um, you know, the, just the timelessness and, the, and, the, and the, the kind of little bit of joy you get from this idea that this thing exists somewhere, you know. I think that in CG, you're always, you're always sort of um, having to, to think about how you can take the computer and turn it into something that feels very much like um, uh, uh, something that's made by a human. And so uh, we've used model building and stop motion as our kind of inspiration. But when you think about scale, uh, for the other films, we've always been trying to just sort of go, how can we make everything feel just a little bit small? And in, and in this case, we had to kind of think, well, yes, sometimes, but then also how do we make things feel really, really big? <laughs> and essentially what you end up doing is sort of building building a lot of the, the things in CGI, uh, the sets and um, uh, and things that you're going to see close up. You almost build two versions of them. I think that they do this in stop motion as well. But that you you we have a lot of sort of um, very high high detailed uh, models and sets for when we're close with snails, so that you can see all the, um, for example, on the beach, all the the little sand grains around her. And then we have. Um, uh, sort of um, bigger sets that don't have quite as much detail uh, for, for when we're going wide with, um, with Whale. Uh, Max, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I mean, just to um, add to the, the comment I made in the making of the, the, the world as a character too, like often when you have these um, have films, it's about the relationship between characters. And obviously the film is about the relationship between the snail and the whale, but it's also about the relationship with their environment and the world. And to me, what was always really appealing about that story is that it's that it it gives you hope <laughs> in a in a bigger sense. Like it, um, 
there's so much when you think about the environment and our world and what's all not working <laughs> and that can give you anxiety but the film kind of does the opposite it's like it takes you by the hand and shows you look at it. it's all so beautiful it's magnificent and yes it's overwhelming <laughs> and we are just a little tiny part in it but we can make a difference like in in our the people who we love and who are next to in our communities um and and so yeah it's i feel like a lot of it is about the relationship with our environment and and that's what i always loved about the story yeah i love what you said just now about you know that um sense of being you know just one little person and maybe feeling like you can't um have this power to change things but in fact you can um but I think what's really brilliant is that you all are building in different ways on this idea of scale, right? Because it also, um, for us, really makes us think about um, kids and their perspective and, you know, this wonderful relationship between this tiny snail and this huge whale um, and how wonderfully you play with that perspective, right? Um, so this, this idea of like, you're showing a viewpoint of somebody who's maybe smaller and thinking about, um, you know, where's their place in the world and how much power do they have? Um, and again, the scale that you said now uh, play with, you know, how all of us, you know, even adults included, how we sometimes feel a little vulnerable in that that relationship that um, carries us through is so extraordinary between the snail feeling a little bit vulnerable and being willing to take a take a chance. Um, and I think um, maybe we can take a look at the next clip and talk a little bit more about how you crafted um, that relationship um, between the two. I wonder if you wanna just say um, a little bit um, before I set up the clip um, about just that dynamic between these two characters. I mean, what I would add like, just is that, the, yeah, I always identified with the snail, right? <laughs> Like we all know that feeling, we all feel small. It's not just if you're a tiny kid. And the irony a little bit of the film is that even the big whale is small compared to the vastness of the world. And I think, and is also vulnerable and relies on other people or the snail in that case to, to help him. And like, we all need someone else to look out for us. I think that's, that's kind of what the relationship is about. You know? Each looking out for each other. Yeah. Yes, and, I, and, uh, and your animation is such a collaborative medium. We, we certainly rely on everybody when we're making a, a, a film like this to, to have our backs. And uh, yeah, so it's, um, it's, it's funny. Um, you always end up living out this, this story that you're trying to tell. And uh, <laughs> yeah, very grateful for, 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 for those relationships in our, in our team. Mm -hmm. And that exactly takes us to our next clip, um, which is about um, the, the both about the collaborative nature of um, how this came together and the different elements, um, and also the storytelling, you know, how you establish um, this, this wonderful sense of drama with um, in very economical means. So let's take a look at the next clip, please. We knew that a lot of the emotion really needs to be there in the score. It's such a poetic film and you just go out on this journey with them and there's very little dialogue and it's really, at least half of the emotion is coming through just through the music. I feel like this film was just made for him. It just is perfect for his music. So this comes back in the tempest. It comes back in when they save the whale, when the it's on the blackboard in the school. And I would say that's the, the the snail theme when when he wants action. Save the whale. So this may be the, the theme that comes back the most in the in the movie. What René's done is that he's created this whole um, world of, of emotion. Um, and it has to be, uh, you know, by turns epic and uh, magnificent, and then very quickly go very small and intimate and, um, and sensitive. 
he shows fragility, he shows vulnerability, and then he shows, you know, um, fun. <laughs> I keep saying René is the soul of our films. Like the team that we have and that creates all the pictures and the, the animation and the performances, they are the heart, but René is the soul. It's nice to see how generous you are as well with your, <laughs> with your team. <laughs> it's really incredible to think about um, each part of this contribution. Uh, I mean, I wonder if you want to just start off a little bit about talking about the music composition. Uh, do you want to go next? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> there, there is this, there is always this humbling experience because we think of, of film as a visual medium and we as directors and the team at Triggerfish, we spent 18 months to a year just working on these pictures. But really it's an audio, audio visual medium and the music is easily 50%, probably more, like in terms of how the, the film comes across. And um, so for having the right fit there um, is, is, is crucial. And we've worked with Rene um, really since the Gruffalo and what always appealed to us um, about his music is that he, it's, it's a kind of romantic take and it, it helps you bring that out. But it sounds like nature in a way. <laughs> like it started out with a mouse walking through the woods and we always felt like, and his music just encapsulated that feeling. And now with the snail in the way, we're kind of elaborating on that and it's, um, yeah, it's, yeah, I, <laughs> it's, it's just such a perfect fit. So yeah, it, um. uh, I'll have to say it's one of my most favorite parts of the whole filmmaking process um, because, um, because uh, it's a lot of it is out of your hands and you have to really trust um, your composer, you know, um, I, I, neither Max or I are, and, and apparently this is a good thing, but neither of, uh, we're neither of us are composers because apparently composers find other com you know people who who know music theory and stuff getting involved a little intense <laughs> so uh so we really are in Rene's hands and and just the way um uh when you see the things come together and the, an absolute cherry on the top for me is when you, if you get to go to the recording and you uh and you get to sit down um, and listen to this 30 piece orchestra play this music uh, and they and they do it sort of in, in one day. They sit down. They've played it like they've played it their whole lives, and it's just full of um, uh, full of uh, heart and spirit. It's it's fantastic. It's like the it's the thing that makes any, any struggle that you had for the past year and a half. It makes it all worthwhile in that moment. It's really great. That's fantastic. Um, and also, just getting back to that um, comment about how. Um, so th there isn't a lot of dialogue, you know, you don't have this heavy reliance on the narrative and people talking to lead things forward. And I think that that also is something that um, the audience has really just responded to, as you said in the beginning, you know, the sense of there's space for the viewer to just kind of be in that world. Um, and I wonder, um, you have an extraordinary voice cast and um, some of my favorites. <laughs> And I wonder if you could talk about that process. You know, it's it's not a lot of dialogue, but what it is is really meaningful. So um, please, if, if one of you would jump in and talk about that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's exactly as you said, there's not a lot of dialogue. So we try to make every line really count. <laughs> I, I'm sure that can be, <laughs> can be a sometimes strange experience for the voice actors in the room because yeah, we go through a lot of iterations of the, of each line because in the moment when you're in the booth, you just don't know what is really going to connect on screen and with the other actors' lines. And sometimes you think it has to be bigger or smaller, um, but then you cut it together and it just doesn't work. So we try to cover our bases. Um, and um, so we really get the perfect take for each line. And because so much has to be said sometimes with just a word, you know, it's just a word and it, it carries all the emotion of the, of the scene. And at the same time, there's this funny thing with animation and that's um, 
where it can easily feel empty because when you shoot a live action film, you record sound at the, at the shoot and it's a big part of why something feels alive and has a presence. And if you just turn off the sound and watch any film, it feels strange. It's, just, it's almost abstract. So we are working very hard um, with the actors to just like even cover a little breath and sighs and all these sounds that um, you get from a, a, an actual shoot. Um, and we put that back in there. And, at this, and then also with the sound design, which is also a huge part of the film. It's also a very, very um, magical moment <laughs> after you've watched all these pictures pretty much silent um, for over a year. And then suddenly there's sound and it gets this presence and you really feel that it's there. So um, yeah, it's, it's absolutely important to, to create that, yeah, that presence and atmosphere to, to make these characters really come to life. Yeah, and I will, I will point out um, the favorite actor that I was referring to is Sally Hawkins, who um, some of our younger audiences may know as the mom in the Paddington films, um, but she's a, a, an extraordinary actor um, in, in so many ways. Um, and uh, I was just impressed that, you know, by her kind of giggling or sighing or, you know, just these little tiny moments of her voicing of the snail, you, you feel like you learn so much about that character. Absolutely, and we're so uh, we were so lucky to to have Sally um, uh, as part of uh, our, our cast. And I think Max, um, you you'd always have Sally in mind ever since Room on the Broom, right? Uh, uh, as Snail's voice. Um, yeah, because uh, we we had casted her as the bird, and we got in the booth with her, and she was so amazing. And in my head, I was just thinking, oh no, the bird I think has only three lines. <laughs> <laughs> and and I made the I meant the mental note and thinking like if we ever get to make the snail and the whale, um, she would be perfect for the snail. Yeah. So something that I um, only realized later on, um, in going back and watching interviews with Sally, is that when she came into the booth, she actually had a whole voice for for snail, and I don't know if she figured it out beforehand or if it just if it's just something that came out into the you know when she was doing performance, but it's not. Snail, the snail's voice is not Sally's voice, you know, it's a character that she's created and it's, and it was just, and she did it so naturally. Um, we were just completely um, in, in love with her performance from the, from the get go. Fantastic. Um, and uh, maybe we can go back to this um, conversation about, you know, all the different contributors um, and uh, the teams, um, but then I think also the inspiration um, Dan, I was thinking about how you were talking about Triggerfish and where you're based and that great team and how maybe your locale might have inspired things. So um, we can perhaps show some uh, photos from your team uh, while you speak to any of those things in terms of inspiration. Oh, cool. <laughs> and collaboration. All right, sure. Um, yeah, so, so uh, uh, Triggerfish is based in Cape Town in South Africa and we're actually in these old barns. <laughs> Uh, that have been converted into an animation studio. So this is this is kind of what every room at Triggerfish looks like, though. It's mainly just people with computers and some. So you can see there's uh, other Magic Light posters on the wall. And this is uh, we do we used to before. I mean, I'm sure we'll do it again one day. But we used to do open days, and kids would come in, and we would talk to them about animation and what we were doing. Because not a lot of people know that animation is is made in South Africa. So that's always a lot of fun. Um, we go to the next next slide. Uh, and uh, I think like every animation studio, the important thing is to have a room where people can blow off. So this is our production designer, Dan Clark, one of um, uh, our, our animators, Jack Common, who actually was the animation director of Zog, uh, uh, Sarah Scrimger, who was our art director, and Malcolm Wolfe, who's a fantastic designer, playing ping pong at Christmas time. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so and, we, and, and you can see some skateboards in the back and some snacks. <laughs> And the highway rat uh, on the on the door there. Um, I can go to the next slide. Um, so for those of you who don't know where Cape Town is, it's right on the tip of of Africa, and um, the uh, what's it called? The I don't even I think that's Table Mountain, or it's part of Table Mountain, or it's not even Table Mountain. But we, it's a really beautiful setting. <laughs> um, we're really really spoiled. We're, we're sort of out on a farm in the middle of in, in the middle of the suburbs. Um, I think that's Mike, our producer, looking at the sunset. 
So, so we drive, um, everyone else is driving uh, in towards the city and then we drive into the country for work or, or used to before, <laughs> before things change. Now we all just uh, commute from home. Uh, and I think there's, is there one more slide? Uh, yeah, so this is, this is the team um, who was working. This photo was taken of the snail and the whale team, but this is actually when we got an announcement about uh, Zog doing, doing well at one or two things. So this is, this is a lot of people who worked on Zog and snail and the whale. Uh, and that's, I think that's it for now. And then of course, there's Magilite pictures in the UK and a lot of the, um, of the work that's sort of uh, done for uh, voice recording, the, um, all the music, uh, all the, the grade and, and post-production is done by Magic Light in London. And then Max, you're based in Los Angeles, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, I'm based in Los Angeles. I only made it to Cape Town for one week because the, the journey is so far. But um, yeah, we would talk every day for at least two hours um, every morning. Um, and so I got to meet the team and work with everyone. That's quite crucial when you work remotely. That you, that you have a like an open communication going on, yeah. But um, yeah. yeah, sadly, I <laughs> only made it out there once. So good, like thirty-two hour flights or something like that. You have to it's stop over in Atlanta yeah. or <laughs> someplace. Um, and um, and Rene was doing the music in, in in his home in France. So it is a very it's very much an international uh, collaboration, uh, definitely. Definitely. And then the other thing it makes me think about is that you're both coastal, you know, you both have these amazing oceans that are um, right in your backyard, so to speak. Um, does that sense of place um, infuse the way that you think about crafting uh, these story worlds? Oh, definitely. And in fact, um, as soon as we had just knew that we were making Snail and the Whale for sure, we all dropped our uh, mouses and keyboards and we all went to the beach. <laughs> and and uh, and we went to a, a spot um, called Boulders Beach, where it, which is famous for seeing a lot of penguins, not whales in particular. But we took our, our, our cameras and our phones and we got really down onto the rocks and amongst the, amongst the different um, uh, rock pools and things and, and did a lot of uh, research right off the bat just to sort of try to get our heads in the space of, of um, what the world might look at, uh, like from Snail's perspective. Um, yeah, and uh, we also did, I think, Max, when you were out, we did a, a, a trip to the aquarium. There's a, there's a really fantastic aquarium uh, in, in Cape Town. And so for all the underwater shots, we wanted our, our, our lighters and our compositors and um, people who are going to be painting the surfaces to kind of get that, just get a sense of what, what the opportunities were, to, uh, how we could tell the story with light and, uh, and create that atmosphere. So that was a lot of fun. And then just to, to look at all the different fish and um, and see how they move and, um, and see the variety. I mean, it's so intimidating. Just, just back to what Max said about the, the world being a, a character. It, it's such an intimidating thing when you see how much variety there is out there and how many different, how many different, just in one environment, how many different creatures inhabit it. It's, it's, uh, it, can be, it can be a little overwhelming. <laughs> so we definitely all were identifying with snail at that point. <laughs> yeah, how do you, how do you go from uh, these you know, huge amount of inspiration out in the natural world to sort of uh, honing what you're going to represent um, in animation. I would say it's always a story that drives our decisions because like directing is very much about like setting priorities and figuring out what's important in each specific shot. And that's almost how we think about it. We go through it shot by shot and think, what, what, why is this shot in the film? And what do we want to convey with that shot? Is this shot about snail's emotion? Then let's be close on the camera. Is this shot about the environment? Let's be far away. Um, and so we, animation is a hugely like collaborative process, right? Like when you see our early sketches, they all <laughs> sketches, that, that's what we can do on our own. And then there's like over a hundred people coming in and helping us making a film. And, um, but what you always want to be careful is that you, as a director, really, you, you try to guide them, um, but you also don't want to send them off in the wrong direction, right? So um, we do a lot of like previous and planning ahead of the time. So then when we actually film a 
either a small set that we get really close up or a really wide set, we already kind of know what we're going to show in the camera. So there's often not much <laughs> beyond these mountains <laughs> that you see in the camera. Like it's, it's really composed for a shot. Um, and um, yeah, it's, so that's how we are able to even do that. Like if we had to build <laughs> every, a huge um, Arctic scene or uh, American landscape that that wouldn't work. Like we really have to yeah, compose it for the frame. Yeah. Um, so that's the perfect segue. Thank you again for our next clip, uh, which I think really illustrates what you're talking about. These very conscious choices you make to advance the story and characters. So let's take a look at that clip, please. What's so beautiful about Snail's journey is that you, you start with her and she's the smallest snail in the flock. And she goes on this journey and with this big whale and she feels incredibly small and does these heroic things and saves the whale. But then having her come back and she's actually bigger than all the other snails um, just because of the her traveling and her experiences have her, like made her grow inside but also literally outside of herself yeah so fantastic um well speaking of that uh idea of a little one growing. We want to make sure that our little ones grow and have a chance to um, voice their own um, opinions and questions here. So uh, if you would be so kind, we have some questions from our audience, our young audience that we're going to share with you. Um, so we're going to go to our first question, which I believe is from Lucas. I'm Lucas and I'm five and I live in Orlando, Florida. My favorite character is the whale. What's your favorite character? Uh, Max, I think you have to go first and then Danny. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's funny. I, I guess I always identified really with a snail <laughs> because I just know that feeling so well where you can be overwhelmed and feel small. Um, and the whale to me was always felt almost more like a supernatural character that comes in and takes Snail on this journey. Um, and yeah, no, I, I think um, Snail, yeah. And, and just to be different, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I remember, I remember a, a friend of mine saying that uh, she really likes what we did with the teacher. I, she's a teacher herself. She, she likes how we portrayed the teacher because in the book, the teacher looks quite cross and, and a little bit sort of, um, you know, uh, annoyed, annoyed, and uh, and in the I think because we made teacher very much um, uh, part of pushing whale out back out to sea and everything. She has a she has one of the strongest arcs for non. <laughs> she goes from from a cross teacher to a hero. <laughs> so yeah, um, I'll say teacher, but I actually think I like. Sorry, we missed that last part, Dan. I really want to hear the last part. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Um, I was just saying that uh, that I uh, that I like um, that I like the teacher a lot, but I also um, identify a lot with Snail. <laughs> okay, I I feel like the contrarian. I like the whale because I feel like the whale has. Um, I love the snail, but the whale also feels like there are a lot of assumptions about the whale that yeah. they have to overcome. I love. Uh, thank you, Lucas. That was a fabulous question. Um, and next up, we have a question from Kaylin. My name is Kaylin. I'm four years old and I live in New Jersey. And how do you make a fishy face? How do you make a fishy face? I think like this, right? You go like this. Mm -hmm. You do that. I think she's asking too full. I think you got it, Dan. <laughs> I think she's asking you to both make a fishy yeah. face and how do you make a fishy face uh, as an animator? 
It's a very good question because um, often when we work in animation, we take reference from real life. Um, like we, if, if we animate a human or a an, more anthropomorphic character, you, you film yourself or someone else and take reference from that, but you can't do that with a, with a whale or a snail or a fish, right? So there's a lot of it, a lot of it is an interpretation and trying to, um, it usually starts with little sketches and um, that then get transformed into these digital puppets and that make the, the fish's face move. And I think Dan had some good uh, input on how you animate the whale too. Yeah, so, um... So a big part of the story, as we've talked about, is just um, uh, the idea that snail is small and whale is big. And, and because of um, how we perceive things kind of relatively, um, if the whale started moving too fast, he started to feel very small. And, and if you watch a lot of animated movies, um, you, you, there's this, um, the way to kind of get energy and excitement out of a character usually is that they kind of they, they make very snappy kind of um, uh, energetic gestures. And uh, very early on, we kind of figured out, well, there's two things. First of all, that if the whale sort of um, uh, sort of used his fins like a human and kind of made lots of gestures and snapped around like that, it would make him feel quite a bit smaller because we, we've witnessed that before in, in some other, um, uh, other shows. Uh, the other thing is, is that because he's always in the water, we also knew that if we, if we were, he, if you were to behave like that, he might just, um, the simulation of the water might just, you know, go completely berserk. <laughs> um, so what we found, uh, for, for whale in his, both in his face and, and in his body is that, um, that less is more. We, we kind of gave him a very kind of gentle, subtle, way of motion that was very much inspired by watching real whales and, and uh, documentary footage of, of real whales and how they move. They're so graceful and they have this very kind of um, beautiful, relaxed way of, 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 of moving through water. They always, um, they never feel heavy. They always feel kind of suspended. And, and when they breach, they feel really energetic. And they, but they also, you know, it's not something that happens like super fast. It kind of, happens quite slowly and it's, it's graceful. So, so yeah, so we really try to slow things down and make them very subtle and, and, uh, and beautiful. I love how you're, you're gesturing, you know, there's so much choreography and everything that you all do. That's so cool. Um, but noted Max that you didn't make the fishy face. I don't know how Caleb's going to feel about that. <laughs> oh, what is that? Like that? How do you do a fishy face? <laughs> That was pretty good. I thought that was pretty good. What about you, Maria Cristina? Are you going to do one as well? <laughs> oh, we did. Oh, but I would love to, but our next question is from Miles. Um, so you're going to My name is Miles, and I live in Brooklyn, and I am four and a half. My question is, why did you pick snails and snail and wheel? All right, we're so going to catch that. Why did you pick snails, which we know is part of the picture book, but um, you know, still in terms of the, um, the inspiration for using a snail creature? Yeah, I, I believe that um, Julia Donaldson has said that it rhymed with whale or, or whale rhymed with snail. <laughs> she started <laughs> off with the idea of two characters in a relationship and she wanted to, to, to give herself contrast and, and the rhyme. And I think I, Max, I mean, I, I, that's that's what I remember um, uh, hearing. Did you, do you, I'm wondering if there's any more detail. I mean, there are these these very obvious reasons why why it ended up being a snare, but I think what you're always looking for in storytelling is contrast. You want contrast between characters and having a, a tiny snail that is very vulnerable um, and doesn't move very much. Um, there's a contrast there to the big whale who gets to see, go out and see the world. Um, and then there's also the contrast between the, the little snail who has an itchy foot and she's always moving around to the other snails on the rock who all just like, they, as the book says, they stick um, tight to the rock and they don't move much and they're not that interested in, <laughs> in going out and exploring. 
So I think there's a lot of like really beautiful like imagery that just comes from a snail. Like the snail who wants to go out travel that that's exciting already. And then yeah, combining a tiny snail with a big whale that also makes for an exciting image that you wouldn't like um, see more. I think I think there's also something uh, lovely about the idea that the snail always has the opportunity to just curl up and hide in her home. You know? um, so so a snail who wants to go out and 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 see it all versus one that wants to kind of um, uh, hide away by herself in her own home. I think that's I think that's part of why it's um, it feels emotional to me. Yeah. Definitely. Um, one of our questions that we have on the Keeman Live um, kind of follows on, on what you all said, but I, I'm curious to hear how you'll answer it. Uh, the question is, is this realistic? So what does realistic maybe mean to you? Um, and how do you feel snail and whale is or isn't realistic? That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really great question. We have some very well, philosophical I, audience members. I just have yeah. to say, Night Gifts audience is the best. Uh, I think <laughs> I think what we're looking for is real or realistic emotions and things that people can relate to. And I feel like that's one of the superpowers of animation is that you can tell a story about something abstract, like a snail and a, and a whale and you, you make them emote and they, but they become so human and everyone can identify that. So it just creates this, this, it becomes real for everyone. Like that, that's one of the beauties about animation is that you can take these things <laughs> and, but you feel like they're really there. And so it's, I think it's, it's realistic on an emotional level. Yeah, I'd second that. I think in terms of the, um, the, the, our approach to building the world of Snail and the Whale, we were really inspired by, by nature and reality, as we've said, but we didn't want to, to try to copy it 100%. You know, uh, I think you can, you can find uh, computer graphics where you can't tell the difference between you know, um, something that's, that's made in the computer and then something that is shot with a camera. Uh, and, and our feeling is that um, because it's based on a picture book, we want to create something that feels believable um, and, and feels satisfying to look at, uh, but but it's actually just it's it's it has a bit more of a um, uh, of a romantic or poetic quality about it. You know that there's a sort of sense of um, uh, we're, we're, it's actually more about taking things away than it is about adding things. If that makes sense, we sort of we, we're trying to kind of show the show certain things to to you to to make you um, feel something in, in a moment about being in in a particular space. So yeah, and uh, so I think in that way, there are, we're, we're, we, we kind of aren't in the same business as uh, people who do VFX for live action films and that kind of thing. It's an incredible thoughtfulness. It's an incredible immersiveness. It's an incredible sensitivity to, to children and to, um, to viewers of all ages just to give um, viewers enough space to um, experience the film, but also, you know, um, take time to take in the emotions and the journey. Um, and, and the animation is extraordinary. Music is extraordinary. The voice acting is extraordinary. So, um, you know, clearly our audience adores it. We are so uh, beyond thrilled that the Oscars have recognized it. We can't wait um, to hear news of its continued <laughs> success. Um, and we're so grateful to have you here, really. Let's, this has been such a wonderful and informative and thought provoking um, conversation. And I'm sure our audiences are, are utterly grateful as are we. So thank you, Dan and Max, it's been terrific. Thank you for thank hosting you so, us. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maria Christina. We really love talking to you. We really appreciate all the, the support that um, that uh, your festival has shown our films. Uh, we're just really, really grateful. Thank you. Likewise, thanks to you as artists. Thanks to your whole team. Thank you to Magic Light Pictures for being such a wonderful partner. Thank you to Triggerfish for being so talented and such a great partner as well. 
Um, and I just want to encourage everyone out there, if you haven't already, please take advantage of immersing yourself or re-immersing yourself in the snail and the whale's world and checking out the new um, Sog and the Flying Doctors, um, which is uh, a delight as well. And interestingly timely and fun and great for all ages. Um, so Magic Light Celebration is part of our regular screening program. We have 14 different feature programs, seven different shorts programs, and extraordinary films from all over the world. So I hope you can check them out and come back later. We have a talk tonight at 7 p.m. for Nahuel and tomorrow for Calamity. Um, so, so grateful to have you. Thank you again. And um, I hope we'll talk soon. Ciao, everyone. Thank Ciao. you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.